Now, despite a perceived revolt against Uganda's strongman, President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, the National Resistance Movement, uh, the party he leads, is in no hurry to find his successor. Sam Gituku spoke to one of NRM's vice chairpersons on the state of democracy in that country. Right. There's been quite a conversation in the social media and, of course, in the media platforms that we have about Uganda and the state of freedom in that country. And, of course, people attacking President Museveni in as far as the situation that has been affecting Bobby Wine, the, uh, that young politician in that country. And now we want to talk to the National Resistance Movement a vice chair. The, he is a vice chair in that political party by the name of Captain George Michael Mukula. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at Citizen TV. It's a pleasure. Great. And let's begin with that particular factor of Bobby Wine and uh, the dramatic arrest and also what appeared to be brutal treatment of uh, that particular politician. Uh, from the perspective of the National Resistance Movement, what was all this about what now has become like a sort of torture against a politician who has a different voice against that of the president? Well, as you do understand, the matter is before court, and it would be, I would be going against the principle of subjudice to comment on a matter which is before court. But, but in your view, was there any torture by the army? Well, these are all issues which are before courts of law, and um, I'm very sure that um, both sides will adduce uh, evidence, and if there is anything that finds him culpable, definitely courts will pronounce themselves. And if my brother um, is found to be innocent, he will also be, uh, the cases will definitely be co will collapse. What is the position of uh, the National Resistance Movement in terms of uh, the freedoms in that country, the freedom of expression for uh, people that may have a different voice from that of the, the leadership of the country, for instance, the government and NRM? We've had a very difficult, traumatic, and violent history. From 1962, when we gained independence, Uganda had only peace and stability um, and the rule of law for approximately two years, until 1964, when we had a national referendum on the lost counties. 1966 was uh, the introduction of the gun, and the gun had never left Uganda there in after. Um, in 1967, we had the Pigeon Hole Constitution. 1969, uh, on the 19th of, Oct of, of December, when the UPC government had their uh, annual delegates conference in Lugogo, there was an attempt on the life of the president of Uganda then, uh, Dr. Apollo Milton Obote. And uh, in uh, a few days, I think it was the 21st at 10 o'clock, all political parties were banned. In 1971, there was the military takeover, and that was the institutionalization of the gun, the introduction of the major gun culture. The military government was in power for eight years, and we lost close to half a million people. In 1979 was um, the new government which came in under Yusuf Lule. He was in power for 68 days, and as you do realize, he was also 68 years, ironically very short time. Mm -hmm. Then comes in Binaisa. Binaisa was uh, uh, one of the uh, classmates of Sir Charles Njonjo. And he was in power for approximately five to six months. Right. And then we had a government of five presidents led by Paolo Mwanga. Then there was the Sham election in 1980. 18th of, uh, of February 1981, uh, Jerome Seven went to goes to, to the bush. Then we had the military, uh, what you call the the uh, guerrilla war, which lasted five years. But while Obote came into power, he was overthrown by a general again, in the name of uh, Tito Kello. And in 1986, uh, 26th of January, Museveni came into power with the National Resistance Movement and the National Resistance Army. What I want to tell you is that the history of Uganda had the violence. Because during the time of uh, the five years guerrilla war, we lost close to three to 400,000 people. Right. What I'm trying to say is that with that violent history, Uganda needs, uh, the people of, need to know 
that that traumatic history gave us rise to a new constitutional dispensation in 1995. And when it was promulgated, the first democratic elections were held in 1996, where a ballot was for each individual, meaning that Article 1 of the Constitution stated very clearly that power belongs to the people, and that was the people's power, meaning that each president had to be elected, or each person, competitor, when we opened the political space for a free democratic competition. Each president or any aspirant had to be elected directed by the people of Uganda. That was the first opening of the political space. In 2001, we had another election, five years after, following the constitutional mandate. And in 1996, uh, 2006, I want you to note that that was the first time we brought in and ushered in the multi-party dispensation after the, economic, after the political reforms. The point I'm trying to state here is that the opening up of the political space now made uh, Uganda and the people of Uganda open mm -hmm. to political competition because we believe in this democratic governance mm -hmm. on the three key pillars the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. The opposition to date and in the last three subsequent elections have not gone beyond uh, with the large political party opposition, and that is Forum for Democratic Change. They have maintained a figure of close to 36 members of parliament, freely elected. The next opposition is the Democratic Party, which is about 16 members of parliament. Then you have the Uganda People's Congress, one of the old parties with the six members of parliament. The National Resistance Movement has maintained a majority of over 316 members of parliament, thereabouts. What I want to tell you is that the opposition is still weak, divided, and not coordinated. And do you think it's weak and disorganized and uncoordinated because of their own mistakes or because of the force that has been used by the, by the party in power and specifically by President Museveni? If you don't have internal cohesion and you have in major internal contradictions, recently you, uh, you're bound to see that uh, definitely they will be defranchised. And definitely the mandate of the people will be withdrawn for them. That's why they have continued uh, to lose elections on the ground. The point I want to tell you is that it's not more than two weeks ago when Forum for Democratic Change disintegrated, meaning that General Muntu formed a new political dispensation, which he will pronounce before the 25th of December. And Colonel Kiza Besije, his other friend, in the same struggle, in the same party, has remained with the Forum for Democratic Change. What does that show you? It tells you very clearly that if you cannot have a coalition, if you cannot have people working together, how can you, with these internal contradictions, mm -hmm. transfer these contradictions into government yes. and hold the structure together? It would definitely be impossible. The opposition we have in the country is very weak. The National Resistance Movement is the most organized party, and that's why they've been able to be in power and retain power for the last 32 years. That's fine, but I want to refer you to the Kenya African National Union, KANU, you know it. It was in power between 1963 and 2002. That's 39 years, unchallenged. And it was very stable, it was very united. But where were the freedoms? In Kenya, the freedoms were curtailed. People were not freely expressing themselves until a new government came from the opposition side. Don't you think that Uganda is facing a similar situation where, the, yes, yes, they have a very strong party, but it's a sort of a dictatorship? Uganda and the National Resistance Movement has been able, is the only political party that has been able to bring total peace to the country, to Uganda. Mm -hmm. From 1986, when we took over power, there's been an attempt by 14 major uh, groups, including the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, Holy Spirit Movement, the UPA, FOBA, ADF, and so on and so forth, to attempt to overthrow this government violently. We have said very clearly that there are two options that you have for acquisition of power. One is the democratic process, and that is the use of the ballot through the microphone, or use the violent means. Uganda 
has gone through the, viol the, the history of violence. We know it very well. And it's very expensive and destructive. We do not want to go to the direction, to that direction, because we've been there before. So how do you do that? How do you ensure that you do not go back there? First of all, we must maintain the rule of law and order, which is very, very important. And that is through the dupe, no more processes of the law, constitutionalism. Even when such action appears to curtail freedoms of uh, voices that are o opposing to what you stand for? I want you to show me one political prisoner in any prison in Uganda who is detained. Nobody is above the law and nobody is bigger than Uganda. Mm -hmm. We all want to work for one nation, mm -hmm. one history, one people, so that we can build a strong nation because each country, like Kenya, Tanzania, have different uh, political path to pursue. Bobby Wine, the MP, uh, one of the independent MPs that you have in Uganda, was at Citizen TV on JKL this week. And one of the things he said is that I did not see Idi Amin, but I think Museveni is worse. He has misruled us longer than Idi Amin, and he has messed up everything that Amin did. Idi Amin was a dictator, but he did not destroy the infrastructure. He did not condone corruption. Uh, he would appear to accuse Museveni of all bad things. How do you respond to that? My friend has got his own view. Let me give you the facts. By 1986, we had only 60 megawatts for the entire Uganda, meaning that only 5% of Uganda had access to electricity. Today, 30% of the country has got access to electricity, and we are moving towards 60%. 60%. Our target is to increase that capacity. How? We built uh, five major dams. Um, we built... Uh, Since 1986. Since 1986. 32 years, five dams. Uh -huh. And do, do not forget, it, since the uh, Adam and Eve left Eden, <laughs> Uganda had only one dam. When the National Resistance Movement came in, we built Nalubale, we built Isimba, we are, built, we are now about to complete uh, Karuma, which is 600 megawatts. We are tackling uh, Ayago. And all this will give Uganda about and close to 2,000 megawatts. And yet, and yet... Let me tell you even more. Uh -huh. Let's look at the facts. Uh -huh. Because you are saying you build destroying the infrastructure. By, one, by 1986, we had 1,400 kilometers of tarmac. Today, we are at, at 6,000 kilometers of tarmac. We have got flyovers, we've got dual carriageways, and we're building the infrastructure to every nation around us, whether Kenya, Malaba to Busia, we have tarmac. To Tanzania, we have tarmac. To Rwanda, we have tarmac. To the DRC border, we have tarmac. South Sudan, we've got tarmac. I want you to also to know that uh, when, you look about, when you talk about infrastructure, by 1986, we had only 48 telephone, 48,000 telephone lines. Mm -hmm. Today we have 22,000 lines climbing, 22,000. When you look at the economic growth, we have maintained 5% growth and above for the last 20 years. Yet, How can a country grow and yet it is being destroyed? Don't you think it's time that uh, President Museveni now paved way for a different person to come and lead the country uh, to the uncharted waters and improve the economy? Uganda has got the youngest population in the world. 50% of the population of Uganda is below the age of 15. That means that approximately 22 plus million people are below the age of 15, consumptive, dependent, and they depend on free universal primary education paid for by government of Uganda, free universal secondary education paid for by government of Uganda, free access to health care at primary level, free immunization. We've got free treatment for uh, HIV. These are social indices that show you that Uganda is on the correct tangent. While we're reducing poverty, we must also address the issues of reduction of, of, uh, of creating employment. Mm -hmm. No country in the world will rede re redefine its path without pursuing five major pillars. One, education or civilization. Two, agrarian, or increasing capacity in agriculture. Uganda has got 48% of the arable land in the entire East, East Africa. Three, industrialization, where job opportunities are. 
the, then the fourth is scientific approach to the country, increasing electricity and so on and so forth. Then the fourth is the ICT. This combination is what we're using in order to tackle the growth of the country. And we're not looking at it only from the Uganda perspective. So we believe that we want to look at integrating the economies of the East African region. But that peace and stability is not Yoweri Kaguta Museveni. Someone else can, can do it, right? We believe that at this stage, our top scorer in the party is General Museveni. And that is why that you cannot take Museveni out of the equation of Somalia now. He's a key, he's a center of gravity in the politics of Somalia and the stability of Somalia. Just before, so, Karen, let me connect that question with this, that not so long ago, the parliament of Uganda passed a law scrapping a cap on the age of uh, presidential candidates or someone who becomes president. It used to be 75, now it's no longer 75. Museveni is now 74, and there's an election in 2021. So he's eligible to run again. Don't you, see, don't you foresee a future without Museveni uh, as the president? Well, and, and how are you preparing for let's that? Let's look at it. Let's be realistic. Uh -huh. Museveni is not immortal. Biology will take over. But the national resistance movement, midwives government, we have a duty as a party to ensure that we continue scoring, we shall continue pursuing our ideological ideals, mm -hmm. and to ensure that the foundation of this country, the institutional framework, is left firm and solid for the future generation to take over. How are you managing the transition even beyond uh, Museveni, whether uh, he leaves office voluntarily or by force of nature, to use that term? There are five political parties that have been quite solid in the world. The North Korean party, the Cuban party, the ANC, uh, and Chama Chama Pindusi that have never lost power in the world. The other party is the NRM. How do you open the democratic space for the young people? Because you're saying that 75% of your population is below 30. But how can they continue to be led by leaders who are way above that, who carries the vision of the young people? Let me be very clear. Mm -hmm. Some of our ministers in government got into government when they were 25 years. We have members of the executive. The minister in charge of investment is 27 years. Mm -hmm. The minister in charge of water is 30 years. The minister in charge of lands, minister of state in charge of lands, is about 34 years. We have a young, a young, now they are going, undergoing tutorship. Mentoring leaders is a process. So you want to mentor through other positions, not the presidency? The national resistance movement, and in any party for that matter, will not negotiate itself out of power. Okay. <laughs> it is a duty. You, you actually think NRM will continue to win election as long as they have Museveni? You doubt that? I don't doubt it. I'm just, I'm just worried without uh, Museveni, what will you do? The political space in Uganda mm -hmm. is opening up. Mm -hmm. We are learning. Democracy is um, a process of governance which was imposed on the African continent. I want you to note that we have an ideal or ideals to pursue along patriotism, nationalism, pan-Africanism, and ensuring that we consolidate the principles of good governance and economic transformation. These ideals mm -hmm. drive the ideology of the national resistance movement. And let me put it as clearly as I can, that our focus, our strategic focus, mm -hmm. is to ensure that at the end of the day, as you know, Kenya, is the, uh, Uganda is the largest trading partner with Kenya. You have, until the last time I checked, 650 million US dollars in favor of exports to Uganda for Kenya. Mm -hmm. And in the reverse, we have about close to 200 million dollars. The, African, the Africans and we, the black people, have a duty to pres prescribe African solutions to the African challenges. These Europeans you see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with all due respect, you give lectures to Africa. Uh -huh. But I want to tell you that it is upon us, the Africans, to prescribe African solutions to the African challenges. And I will give you the example of, 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 of Rwanda. Rwanda, when we had the struggle inside Rwanda, the Europeans under the UN flew all their people out of Rwanda and left one million people to perish. I want to tell you, the trauma Rwanda has gone through 
is not something that should ever, ever happen again in any African country. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're saying that we would like to protect our integrity, our territorial integrity. Mm -hmm. Now that we have discovered oil as Uganda, don't forget, there are hawks, there are people who are interested in the African resources. It has been their perspective and it is their strategic goal and it is in their interest to see that they can continue to dominate the African base. You're very close to the president. Yes. You, are, you also call him your friend, Bobby Wine. You call him your friend. Yes. Now, your friend Bobby Wine told Jeff Koinange that Ugandan president's mind has been corrupted by those who surround him since they shower him with empty praise. Do you shower the president with empty praise? No, far from the truth. He I actually say, tell the president mm -hmm. what he needs to know. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not um, an employee of government, mm -hmm. I've got no benefit. I'm in the private sector. I'm self-sufficient. I'm a strong businessman. But, but I want to see Uganda stable. I want to see a strong East Africa. I want to see an integration of our economies. Mm -hmm. He also said that uh, he believes that President Museveni is drunk with power and they wanted to kill Bobby Wine because he threatens that power. That's political rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, finally, um, recently we had a charge on social media uh, that if you are using social media in Uganda, you have to pay 200 Ugandan shillings, equivalent to about 5 shillings 20 cents. Why would you be doing so? Don't you think you're just curtailing the freedoms of the young people who are in a position to use the social media? We are looking at ways and means of generating revenue. And we have looked at what you call indirect taxes. These indirect taxes have been able to create a growth of our tax base in terms of ratio to GDP. Our tax base was low. I think we are the lowest in the East African region at about 7%. Mm -hmm. We are now at 15%. We've got to finance many sectors of growth. We've got to finance infrastructure, the roads. We've got to finance education, which is free. We've got to finance uh, um, things like uh, health. The population is, is uh, as I've said very clearly, is large. Um, when you have a young population like Uganda has, the challenges are immense. Mm -hmm. And we must find re resources and means of ensuring that first we maintain peace and stability. We have a, a robust security system. Mm -hmm. Because as you know, having a young population is also a challenge, it's a powder cake. Mm -hmm. We must provide opportunities in terms of job creation, we must provide opportunities in terms of reduction of poverty. Even, even when we must fight for corruption. Even when the means would appear to curtail the freedoms of expression and democratic space in the social media? No, I've already told you that uh, Uganda is a country where I have challenged you to show me one person who is a political prisoner. They don't need to be prisoners, but they are those who are intimidated by actions, illegal arrests. The point is that you can challenge any action of government in courts of and law. Can you get justice? You can also, definitely. I, I want to tell you that many people have gone to court mm -hmm. and have definitely defeated government. And government has had to compensate for either wrongful actions or otherwise. And don't forget, mm -hmm. we do not in any way allow anybody to exercise uh, any principles of impunity. The ex, uh, like, for example, the army. Before and you know, before the new constitutional dispensation of 1995, mm -hmm. we executed 145 uh, uh, officers and men of UPDF who carried out extrajudicial killings in civilian areas. Show me one government in the African continent which has done that. Until we had the new constitutional dispensation, I want to tell you impunity, extrajudicial killings, or state-inspired violence is not something that will be accepted in Uganda. All right, Captain George Michael Mukula. Mukula. Thank you so most much welcome. for speaking to us on Citizen TV, You're specifically on the break. You've been watching Captain Mukula, George Michael Mukula, who is a vice chair of the National Resistance Movement. Thank you so much and you most wish you well in Uganda Thank as you. you try to continue with the pursuit of democracy. We will pursue that judiciously religiously and ensure that there is enough space for every Ugandan because nobody is bigger or greater than Uganda. All right. Thank you.